Okay, we are going to begin our journey with digital signals by looking at a digital signal. All right, now remember, when we're talking about these Boolean values, this true, false, on, off, up, down, we're gonna be representing these with numbers. Now, there's only two numbers needed, right? Zero and one. And in order to distinguish these from the integer zero and one, we're gonna actually put the term logic in front of it. So um, I'm gonna have these two different levels, this logic zero and a logic one. Those two values that we're gonna be going back and forth and uh, across over time. So if you're thinking about you know time passing, in that direction. What we've got is this signal that changes back and forth kind of randomly. If we were to think of this as perhaps, I don't know, maybe you're following a car that has brake lights um, and you're, you're driving, you're not driving, you're, you're the passenger and you're watching the brake lights in front of you. If you took it out of the context of the traffic that's around you and you saw kind of this, well, this light that's turning on and off with the seemingly random, a seemingly random nature, that's kind of what this signal is that I'm showing you up here. Now, the features of the signal, the components components of this signal are really important when we start talking about controlling things with logic zero and logic one. First thing I want to talk about is an edge. Now, right here, we have what is referred to as a rising edge. A rising edge is whenever we have that moment, whenever we have a transition from a logic zero to a logic one. And conversely, we have the transition from a logic one to a logic zero. This guy is a falling edge. All right. Now, think about taking a picture. Whenever you've got your camera or your phone and you're, you're you know, putting your finger on the button, you don't want the picture to be taken as long as your finger is on the button. You want it the moment your finger tap touches the button, taps the button, and, and that would be an edge, all right? Um, now, you put two edges together, and what you've got is a pulse. So right here we have a, let's just do this one, we have a logic zero going to a logic one for just a moment of time, and then going back to a logic zero. So this guy right here, it's referred to as a pulse. Specifically, though, it is referred to as a positive going pulse. All right, now, conversely, we have a negative going pulse, and that is whenever we go from a one to a zero and back to a one, and we've got one of those right here. This guy's a negative going pulse. Now, pulses, of course, are used, well, think about the brakes, right? Your, your brakes are engaged as long as your foot is on that pedal, having uh, you know positive pressure on that pedal, so to speak. Now, as I said before, this is kind of a random nature. This this signal has kind of a randomness about it, um, and therefore it actually is it. And, and in fact, what we've got, what we're really going to call this signal, is something called a pulse train. It is a train of pulses, a sequence of pulses. So this guy is called a pulse train, but the random nature of this pulse train means we give it the name a non periodic pulse train. That's what this guy is. All right. Now, we got a non-periodic pulse train. Guess what? We probably also have a periodic pulse train, right? Well, a periodic pulse train has a slightly different look about it. It has a regularity. In fact, if you were to draw something, and I'm not going to do it perfectly here. <laughs> of course, I didn't do it very well at all. It's, this, it's got this cadence about it. It's got this heartbeat about it, all right? And it keeps going and going. And in fact, with this top non-periodic pulse train, if I were to ask you what the signal looked like beyond what I've drawn here, you couldn't predict it because it's random in nature. Could be up, could be down, right? But this guy right here, if I draw enough of it, it's likely that you could be able to continue to draw it. Now, in order to continue drawing it, there are two features of the signal that we need to know. 
The first thing is, how fast are those pulses coming? What is the cadence? Now, the measure we typically use to identify the cadence or the the uh, how fast the pulses are coming is the time between uh, between consecutive rising edges or the time between consecutive falling edges. We represent this with a capital T and we refer to it as the period. Now the period is measured in seconds. Now more specifically it is measured in the number of seconds per cycle. In other words, how many seconds does it take for us to go through a full cycle? All right. Second feature, the second measurement that we need in order to accurately measure or, or represent this signal is, well, right here I've got these positive going pulses. Now, the positive going pulses, you know, forgive my, you know, accuracy of my drawing here. Um, it, in this case, it looks like it takes up about half a cycle, but it's possible that these pulses could be really narrow and come at the same period, right? So the second thing that I need to have in order to, to represent this signal is what we refer to as the pulse width, which is represented with a lowercase t sub w. This guy is the pulse width. Now, more specifically, it is the positive going pulse width, but when it comes to representing these, these periodic pulse trains, it is, we're, we're just gonna refer to it as the pulse width. And so this guy, as I just said a moment ago, uh, is a periodic pulse train. Now you've got one of these guys inside of your computer. Specifically, there has to be some sort of an electronic signal that keeps things moving inside the processor. It's called a system clock, and what it does is it gets the electronics to move to the next step in the execution of each one of the instructions that the processor is executing. In fact, if somebody were to ask you, hey, you got a new computer, right? Well, what kind of computer did you get? Well, one of the words or one of the descriptions you may use in the description of this computer that you just got would be something like, oh yes, it's a 3.2 gigahertz, you know, quad core. What? Yeah, that gigahertz thing. That is something that we represent the performance or the, 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 rep, you know, the characteristic of the processor called frequency. Okay, now frequency typically is represented in units of hertz. All right, hertz actually has another name. There's another way of, of defining this unit. It is, uh, and in fact, that's probably a bad delimiter there. Uh, it could also be called cycles per second. All right, notice a relationship here. Look, I've got a period is seconds per cycle. Frequency is cycles per second. That seems, uh, seems like there must be some sort of a relationship there. Turns out there is. Turns out that frequency is equal to one over the period, all right? And so it's really easy to figure out what the period of the clock signal is for your particular processor. For example, let's go ahead and say that I've got a 3.2 gigahertz machine. Now, gigahertz, this G right here, of course, represents some sort of a, um, it's a multiplier. And in the case of giga, that means it's 3.2 times 10 to the ninth hertz or cycles per second. Well, if we want to figure out what the period is for this particular device, all we have to do is invert it, right? So we invert one over 3.2 times 10 to the ninth hertz. And this gives us, well, let's figure this out. Wow, um, bring up the calculator. All right, so we do 3.2 times 10 to the ninth, and then we invert that, and we get this horrible, horrible number. 3.125 times 10 to the negative 10th seconds. That's a really small number. 
And in fact, we use this prefix right here, giga, that prefix right there actually represents, you know, 10 times to the ninth. Well, we have the ones for the negative too. So, and I don't know if you can see this quite. I'm gonna, maybe I'll just go ahead and draw this up here just so that I can still stay on the camera. Um, this is the same thing as 312.5 times 10 to the negative 12th seconds, which is equal to 312.5 picoseconds. That's a really small number. All right. What we're going to move on to next time is we're going to talk about how these pulse trains can be used to dim an LED.